Well, thank you very much, Ray. Thank you, Teacher Survivability Society, for inviting me. And I want to talk about education and funding. Now, we know that there's lots of funding around for everybody. Nobody's had no problems getting funding to come here. Uh, I may be being a little bit tongue-in-cheek. The funding issue is probably getting worse at the moment. And we know that from lots of government papers that have been out. So did you all see the comprehensive spending review in November 15? It would have been nice, easy bedtime reading. Now, this was all about the government's way of saving money and saying that NHS professionals would then be paying for their undergraduate degrees. So this is when nursing had to pay physio, OT and everyone else. So they looked at pre-registration. Everybody heard about that. And they knew, didn't they, you will have known that the students no longer had the bursaries but had the loans. What wasn't quite so clear was how would we as post-registration staff access education. For people in England, we've used Health Education England have always given us money, either given it to the trust or they've given it to the university so that we could access different modules. The Welsh Assembly has been giving money out as well to trusts and universities, but they've been, they're a little bit behind us in that they're still supporting post-registration education, as is Scotland and Northern Ireland. So from the English point of view, we're the ones really that have seen the biggest cut in post-registration. But in February 18, we saw healthcare education funding changing quite a lot and priorities being identified for each area. So some of the priorities include post-registration, medical training and dentistry training. There is nothing in there that mentions about tissue viability as a specialist area which probably isn't surprising because I don't think we're always recognised as a specialist area. Would you agree? Yeah, we'd like to think we are specialists, but sometimes other people look at us and go, well, what's so special about you? Why should we give you money? What do you do that's any different? We all look after skin. So it's about us being able to say we are a priority area. And it is probably one of the few areas as well, tissue viability, that affects every single patient. Would you agree? Yeah, because everybody has skin. You might have a lot of it or not so much of it, or you might have a burn on it, but we have to look after the skin. And still, we're not seen as a priority area for some reason. But Health Education England has slashed its workforce development planning. Remember, without tissue viability being a priority either. So now we have got one and a hundred... 104.3 million has been slashed last year and there will be more being slashed this year. If you go and speak to your education funders within your own trusts, then they'll say to you, well, actually we're looking at mentorship is one of maybe one of our priority areas because they want everybody to have the mentorship course. So student nurses, student midwives, student podiatrists can be looked after while they're out on the ward area. Medicine is being given quite a lot of money as well. And a lot of the funding is being looked at the nursing associate now as well. Has so everybody heard about the nursing apprenticeships? Two-year training program. Brand new idea. We've never heard of this before. Somebody being trained for two years. So I'm not sure what name they will be given afterwards. But you know that the apprenticeship will be in every single speciality. So there'll be podiatry ones, OT ones, and nursing ones. But it may be worth having a look at this paper that came out. So it's Facing the Facts, Shaping the Future, a Health and Care Workforce Strategy for England in 2027. So we're looking at the next eight ye nine years here. This is for England, but remember, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland generally look at what's happened in England and then they will give out a different sort of policy paper, but very similar to what's happened here with the Department of Health. And this is what the paper is saying. It says the NHS needs radical action to improve working conditions, boost training retention, and become a model employer for staff. And they're going to achieve that within the next nine years. At the same time as removing funding, for your QIP and the quality indicators 
and slashing the education budget. So I'm very confident that in the next nine years we're going to have excellent tissue viability services and lots of money and more staff. This is because this is being recorded as well, so I'm trying to be very politically correct. But it does actually set out a range of measures to improve productivity, to boost training, to open up new routes into nursing, which is your apprenticeship, remember, and prepare the future workforce. And this is what's interesting for technical advances such as genomics, artificial intelligence and digital robotics. I know you're all thinking, right, am I going to be replaced by a robot? Which you're not, but what they're looking at is trying to make things easier. So to get us into the 21st century and can we look at more diagnostics? Again, not particularly related to tissue viability, but if we look at what we've got, I think there's a lot of things we could do with some robotics and diagnostic tools because we're quite reactive sometimes. You see a wound, you'll put a dressing on it or you'll put compression on it and you'll give lots of care. But if we could be able to identify them at a much e earlier state, so we've got legs matter at the moment, looking at prevention, then I think there's areas of artificial intelligence and virtual reality we could actually be using, and in education as well. But we are talking about access in education, and we've said there's not as much funding around as we'd like, but why do we have to educate ourselves? Is it important? Are you sat here now and thought of the past two days, brilliant, I'm going to go back and cascade everything I've learnt down to everyone else? Or is it more that I've updated myself and I've met my revalidation requirements? Or I've had a nice two days away? Or does it help with promotion? So there's a range of different reasons why we access education. But sometimes, what do we think is education? So we have study days. So one-off study days that your trust may do or the local universities. Reading journals and books as well, remember. That does count as education and counts for your revalidation as well. So as long as you reflect upon what you've learned and how it's going to influence your practice or the practice of others, that's good. Or you may do a systematic review of the literature and actually find out there's no literature out there that supports certain interventions and what the limitations are. So that's education. Networking, where you share ideas with each other. And of course, there's higher education institutions, modules and courses. There's also your industry developed educational activities. That counts for education and competency frameworks that people will be using within their local trusts or local areas of work. But where do we access funding? So your own employer should have a small training budget. But if you cast your mind back to a couple of slides ago, it's where are the priorities for your local trusts or healthcare areas. So is tissue viability a priority area to send people on courses for? Or is it that, like say, mentorship or renal or diabetes is more of a priority area and they have only got a limited amount of funding Fund yourselves, of course, but some of these courses aren't very cheap. Industry as well are very good, and there's lots of bursaries they're able to offer, competitive bursaries, charitable organisations, and there's certain universities, higher education institutions that have modules there that can be supported by industry for funding. So industry will pay your course fees to come onto a university course. But there's also a range of scholarships. I'm not sure if people know about these. So there's one called the Barber's Scholarship, which is up to £10,000 that anybody in this room can apply for. And it's if you want to take a master's or a PhD programme. It's relevant for all nurses and midwives across the UK, and that's open annually. So you just have to have an idea and send your idea in via the application. Just remember, when you're going in for higher education programmes of study, you need to say what the gap is in the literature, why is it important that you're going to do this piece of work, and how will it change practice. 
There's the June Clark Travel Fellowships, and these are for Welsh nurses. And it supports staff to go out to different countries to look at what's going on in those countries relevant to their area. So you have to be working in Wales, can be a student undertaking an approved course of study, and a preference will be given to people that are early on in their nursing career, so may have just registered and maybe a couple of years in. So you could go to any country there. So you may want to go to the States to see how they manage private health care, or you might want to go to a developing country to see how they manage tissue viability, leg ulcers, wound management, or diabetes. The RCN as well offer a range of scholarships and a lot of these scholarships are undersubscribed and I think it's because people don't actually know about them or sometimes think, oh well I can't apply for it because why would I get it, I don't do anything. But it's there for anybody that's got a good idea so don't feel that, oh I'm only a band five, I'm only a band six or I'm only a nurse. You're the leaders and the changers of the future so you deserve to apply for these and win them as much as anybody else. So the RCN have foundation scholarships. They're for nurses and midwives wishing to demonstrate the role of clinical leadership in the management of long-term conditions. And this links in nicely to skin, tissue viability and leg ulcers because I would class all those as long-term conditions in some way. So band five may want to be a band six or a team leader. Band sixes and band sevens may want to be specialist nurses, consultant nurses, whatever it may be. But don't think about your band. Think about what you want to lead or do you want to develop a new service. They'll pay for travelling and they'll pay for you to go and help you find the areas that will be of use. Remember, if you're going to places such as developing countries, check the Foreign Office website that it's actually safe for you to go because they'll ask you about that in interviews as well. Have you checked it's safe to travel? So also the Florence Nightingale Scholarships. Everybody heard of those? Or anybody never heard of them? Nope. Florence Nightingale was a nurse <laughs> a couple of years ago. She trained with me. Well, that's how old I'm feeling at the moment. So it's a Florence Nightingale Scholarship and there's three types of scholarships you can access. So there's a research one, so that's up to £5,000 for each scholar. And you undertake a P either, you can do a research methods module, you can use it towards a full master's, you can use it towards doing a PhD. Now if you're doing a master's or a PhD, they'll look at being able to help you fund that for the two or the three years it takes you to complete that programme of study and they'll ask you about this in the interview. You may just want to do a master's research module and they will help you fund that as well. The application forms are able to download off the Florence Nightingale Scholarships website and they're open annually. There's also a travel scholarship and this is up to £5,000 available for anybody that applies to travel wherever you want to travel to look at an area of practice you want to develop. Now, I was lucky enough to win one of these travel awards a couple of years ago, and I went to Australia and went out to work with the Aboriginal community for a short while to look at diabetic, diabetic foot ulceration, diabetes, and how renal disease can affect wound healing. So you fill in your application form, send it in, and then you go for an interview in London, and they will give you the money personally for you to go and spend on your travel. So they expect you to do everything yourself. Now, I was quite shocked by that, so I thought it would go to my place of work, and they would book everything for me. But they said, no, it's your scholarship, you have to spend it. So I got a bit twitched, I thought, oh, what does they think I spent it on just going out? But you do have to write a report afterwards. So for all of these, you write an interim report and a final report, and then you're invited to go and present at the Florence Nightingale Conference as well. But these are really good scholarships to go for, and they are undersubscribed. There's also general leadership scholarships they offer, and these are for up to £15,000 for nurses working at a senior level. 
And I would think that a lot of people in this room are working to quite a senior level at the moment, running your own clinics, looking after patients on your own, not actually being out there, looking after people. So you can look at this and then you will, for a general leadership scholarship, they again give you the £15,000 and you decide which courses you want to go on to develop yourself. You just get you a mentor as well. So it may be a senior nurse from the Department of Health or a senior nurse within a different trust. Could be a medic, could be a podiatrist, could be anybody who can help you develop your leadership skills. There's also what we call an aspiring Dean's Leadership Scholarship. So anybody from a university here? Good. So if you want to be a Dean, then you can apply for this. So again, senior lecturers may think my future career plans are to go and run a school of nursing or a faculty of health. So again, you apply for the £15,000 and you'll go around different universities and work with different deans. What the Florence Nightingale Scholarship people said was that all their money previously had been going to clinical nurses rather than nurses and podiatrists that were working within a university setting. So they wanted to be able to help support those type of professionals as well to develop their own skills. Nurse director. Anybody want to be the nurse director of the future? Okay. Well, there's one there, if anybody fancies it, to go to. But again, if you think that actually next few years I could be the next associate nurse director, I can do a better job than everybody else is doing, then these are the sorts of things you'd look at going for to help support you get to that. And then there's emerging leaders. So these have band sevens and eights that want to develop their own leadership skills. And again, there's £10,000 here for people to access that can then help you with your education and you can go around the country and see different people and learn from them. Again, there's lots of bursaries around for conference attendance, such as TVS, where we are at the moment. And people will have received the emails from TVS before talking about bursaries that you could apply for to help you attend here. Wounds UK, you will have seen all their flyers coming out with all the bursaries about apply for it now to attend Wounds UK in November. And again, industry direct sponsorship, which people are very much aware of. We know the rules are changing, so you need to check with your own local areas on how you can access sponsorship and check with the different companies as to how they can help sponsor you. And research bids. Anybody putting in a research bid now, myself included, are all being encouraged to include into that bid funding for dissemination activities. So attending conferences that you can put papers into and share the outputs of your research, and also for publishing open access journals. Some open access journals can charge £1,000 to £2,000 per paper for us to publish in. And we want to get stuff out there quite quickly, really, and not have to wait 12 months. So don't forget, if you put any sort of bids, add in education and conferences. For those people that think, well, I've done my master's module or I've done quite a few modules now and I want to do some postgraduate research, there's lots of industry colleagues that offer out um, academy awards to help nurses go and undertake a PhD or a master's and they will pay your fees for you. It's competitive and you go to be interviewed, but you get your fees paid directly to the university. Local universities will have what we call fee waiver PhDs and fee waiver masters that you can apply for. Again, it's competitive. And what they'll say, the university will put on their website, we are looking for an investigation into tissue viability as a speciality or the use of a hydrocolloid on managing burns patients. You can apply to undertake that piece of research and the university will waiver their fees for you. Did you know about that? No, so you just have to look at your local universities and see what they want researched at the moment and who are offering fee waiver PhDs. 
And then there's also PhDs with a stipend. So if you look around again at your local universities, there'll be some that will say, we will pay your fees, plus we'll give you a stipend. Stipend's normally about £15,000 a year. So it's so we can get somebody to come and do a PhD full time and we will give you £15,000 as well. But if you're doing it full time, you will have left your job. So actually we find it quite different, difficult within health to get practitioners to come and do that because you're not going to give up a job that's paying you 25000 to have £14,000 a year as a stipend. Unless you've just registered and you've not actually had a full salary yet and think, oh, I'll carry on studying. But they're all there, and generally every university will have something. If they've got nothing about tissue viability, leg ulcers, skin integrity, and you're in the clinical areas and you know what the real issues are there, if you contact your local university with the person that's responsible for that area and have a chat with them and say, look, these are things that really need looking at. Is there any chance you could have it as a priority for your PhDs? As you know, we, well, I run the Tissue Viability Leading Change Business Skills Development Module, and I'm not very good at short titles, and anybody that knows me knows that. But we have done, um, we have a partnership with Ergo, and Ergo will sponsor 15 places to do this module every year. So it's a business skills development module. So there are other, there may be other universities that have a partnership with a company that may offer to pay your fees to do a certain module. So what does all this mean for you? Well, in a nutshell, there is no money for anybody at the moment. And I can't see for the next few years is going to be pots and pots of money that will suddenly appear for us to be able to apply into to get our funding paid. But it will improve over the next few years with any luck. So we do need to start looking cleverly at how do we access funding for our education needs and to look at what does education mean. So we've gone through a lot of scholarships that are available there that people don't apply for and don't know about as well. So have a look online, just Google it, look on the RCM website and they have a huge, they've got hyperlink to all the different scholarships that are available. Podiatrists as well, look on the HCPC and see what they've got as well. So remember the RCM will be more for nurses and midwives and podiatrists. But the, health, the allied health professionals should have plenty as well that they can access into. A lot of industry as well will support education through non-restrictive educational grants and they'll pay the fees directly to universities for you. And if you want to do a PhD, you can apply now for a postgraduate loan. So as the undergraduates now no longer have bursaries, but they have to get a loan, postgraduate students can now get a loan to pay their fees as well. So the future is maybe a little bleak in that we haven't got as much money, but there are lots of avenues that we can go down to try and get funding, and there's lots of different ways. One of the biggest things to remember is to reflect on what you've learned for your validation as well, and don't just put in your validation documents or your reflective documents, I attended TVS. You need to say, what did I learn from that? so you can show that your knowledge and skills are developing. But for everybody that is successful in getting education funding, I have a gift for you all. And the gift is you can take my dog out for a walk <laughs> three times a week, because she is a Springer Spaniel, and I am not fit enough to keep this one fit enough. Thank you very much for listening. So we have time for two questions. Any questions or comments? Oh. It's not a question, it's just a comment. Um, I was successful in gaining some funding from the Queen's Institute. Oh, yes. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, so there are quite a few around. It's just we don't always go looking for it. So definitely Google and have a look at what's there. And people do not apply for these scholarships, remember. 
So you're in with a really good chance. Any other questions or comments? Hi, Karen. Hi, Alison. <laughs> Do you think, obviously, like we know there's no money around and you know it, it's hard to get courses. And as, as a specialism, is that going to have an effect on our tissue viability service in the future? Because people are not accessing as many courses as they once did. No. Good. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, because I think edu we all need to be educated. We've all got to be kept up to date. But I said right at the beginning, I don't think education is just about sitting in a classroom and getting a module and saying, I've got a master's, I've got a PhD, I've got three PhDs, I've got a prof doc. It's about the experience as well. And that's why it's so important that we set up link nurse groups, that we're very loud about what we do to say these are changes, to publish what we do as well and to share best practice. Yes, we need the academic side as well. Of course, I'm going to say that I'm an academic, so, and we need education, but not everybody needs a master's. What we've got to do is stand up and start say, and protecting it, tissue viability as being a multidisciplinary speciality that works in an interprofessional way, that we actually join together, work as a team, and it works across all boundaries, and we should have a seamless service of care. Any more questions or comments for Karen? Well, I have a, a question for you, Karen. Why do you think it is that as nurses were a bit reluctant to come forward and secure funding? Because over the last few years, we've had lots of funding given to health education England and from Wales, Scotland, and people haven't had to go and look for funding. So it's always been relatively easy to get, and people have forgotten how to go and get it. Whereas in the 80s, we had to, oh, you see, <laughs> sermon. <laughs> Whereas in a few years ago, when I was younger, then we had none of this. So we had to go out and find it. Then we got very flush with money. And then we've gone back again to having to save money. And we know it's big circles. It'll come round again. I want to leave now because I'm getting into sermon. Okay. Sorry. Okay, thank, thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Carrie.